Unity just added an experimental tool to the profiler called the Jobs Profiler, and it finally gives us a visual way to see how our jobs are scheduled, when they run, and what the main thread is waiting on. In this video, we'll explore how to use it, starting with a simple job and then moving into parallel and dependent jobs, so we can actually watch Unity's multi-threading behavior play out in real time. Let's get into it. Okay, to start with, this is an experimental package, so you need to open up the manifest.json file in your packages folder. We're going to make a new entry here, and I'm just going to put mine in alphabetical order. Once you're done this, you're going to want to open your project, and you'll be able to see the new experimental package from the package manager, and you can update it from there too as new releases come out. So why don't we create a few jobs and see just how this works? Let's start by doing something simple. We can define a mono behavior named simple job example. At the top, let's declare a native array to store the result from our job and a job handle to track and control its execution state. Next, I'm going to define a new struct that inherits from iJob. I'm going to name it addJob because its purpose will be to perform an additive computation on two numbers in a separate worker thread. This block will represent the actual unit of work that Unity's job system will schedule and run asynchronously. Every iJob must define an execute method, and our job will need two float inputs, which will combine in our computation. We can expose a native array so our job can safely write its output back to main thread accessible memory. Inside execute, we can simulate a moderately heavy computation. We can create a float accumulator called sum and run a loop 100,000 times, each iteration adding the sign of a gradually changing input. This will give us a somewhat realistic workload that we can see in a parallel processing test. After finishing the loop, we write the computed result into the first element of the native array so the main thread can later retrieve it. Now in update, we can allocate a one element native array using the temp job allocator. This keeps memory alive for a short period, long enough for our scheduled job to complete safely. We can instantiate the add job, passing in our two inputs and the shared result array. Then we can schedule the job with the schedule method, which queues it for background execution and returns a job handle. Finally, in late update, we'll call complete on the job handle to block the main thread until the job finishes running. Then we can dispose of the native array to release its temporary memory allocation and keep the memory lifecycle clean and predictable. Now let's go see what this looks like in the jobs profiler. So back here in Unity, let's open the profiler. You can find it under Windows Analysis, or you can use the keyboard shortcut, which is Control-7. Just ignore my garbage from earlier. I'm going to select Clear on Play, hit Control-P to go into play mode, hit Control-P again to stop the game. Now we can select a point in the top row here. I'll come right to the first frame. And right now we're still looking at the default profiler view. However, if you come over to the left where it says Timeline, and normally you might select something like Hierarchy, we now have a fifth option that says New Timeline Experimental. Now we're getting an enhanced view of what's going on in this frame. If I expand the job section, you can see it's going to list all of the worker threads. And you can see my simple job example is listed as running on worker three. Selecting this job will show us two arrows. The purple arrow marks where the job is scheduled, and the red arrow shows where complete forces the main thread to synchronize. Together, this will visualize how the main thread delegates work to a worker thread and then pauses only when the result is needed. Now, you may have noticed you can also expand any of the workers. So underneath our scheduled job add job, we can also see Unity's internal call that's responsible for executing the compiled version of our job's execute method. Clicking on either of these will give you more details on the right panel there. So for our iJob, it will show you which process scheduled the job and which one completed it. You can click on either of those to bring them into view in your timeline. Now, if I use my scroll wheel, we can expand this just a little bit. We can see the call to complete lines up with the end of our job. Another nice feature is if you hold down Alt and your left mouse button, you can pan and it works up and down too, which is nice. So even though this is a very simple use of the tool so far, it should give you an idea of what we're about to dive into with some more complicated examples. So let's jump back to code and make something a little bit more advanced. So what if we had two jobs where one was dependent on the other? Here we could declare a native array of type float that we just call data. And this will be a list of floating point values that both jobs will need to read and write. 
We can also declare a job handle so that we can run the complete method on the last job of the chain. Now let's define a struct called square job that implements iJob. The job needs access to the array of numbers so we can expose the same native array float and inside execute we can loop over the entire array and square each element. Then we can define another job we'll call root job which also implements iJob. This one will depend on the first job's results. So we'll take the same native array float reference since we'll reuse the same buffer that square job just modified. Inside of its execute method, we'll loop over each squared number and apply math square root, returning to its original value. So this is a contrived example, but it'll demonstrate how one job's output becomes another job's input. Let's create a start method up at the top. Here we can allocate a new native array with 256 elements using allocator persistent. So it stays valid across multiple frames until we explicitly dispose of it. Then we can initialize the array with a simple sequence of values, 0 through 255, just to have something to process. In the update method, we can schedule our jobs. We can instantiate the square job and assign our data array to it. Then we can schedule the first job by calling schedule. This will queue it for execution on a worker thread and return a job handle handle representing that pending job. Then we can set up the second job. This will process the results of the first job and again we pass in the same data. Then we schedule the second job but this time we provide handle A as a dependency. This tells Unity not to run root job until square job has finished. The new handle represents both jobs as one combined dependency chain. In late update we'll call complete. This blocks the main thread until both jobs are done. If they've already finished by this point it returns immediately. This guarantees the data is safe to read afterwards. And then in on destroy let's make sure to call dispose so that we release the memory we allocated earlier with allocate or persistent. Every manually allocated native array must be explicitly disposed. So let's immediately bring up the profiler here with control 7. I'm going to click clear on play and hit control P. Then I'm going to stop the game again right away. Let's come over to the very first frame, switch back to our new timeline view. I close the profiler, which is why I have to change all these settings again. The first thing I notice here right away is job handle complete. You can see it's running for quite a long time. Just ahead of that, we can see our update method where we actually invoked the job. But that's not the really interesting part. Let's expand the job section over here and I'll just come down a little bit so that we can see it. So if I alt left click, I can pan down here and select the first job, which was our square job. You can see the purple line is coming from our update method pointing right down to this first job and clicking the second shows the purple line continues across the first job pointing to the second job and then we see the red arrow returning back to the main thread. I'll just adjust the view a little bit here so we can see the entire life cycle in the viewport. Now it's a little bit difficult to see but there is a third color of arrow going on here and it's yellow connecting the two jobs and over in the right panel we now have some information on the dependencies. Now in this simple example it's very obvious to see what's happening but in a more complex job scenario I'm sure you can imagine how useful this would be for debugging. Additionally if we look down in the bottom panel here you get more detailed statistics about runtime, wait time and so on for each of your jobs and not just your jobs but all the jobs that are running. Okay so we've looked at dependent jobs let's look at parallel jobs. So in my new class here let's declare two new fields native arrays of type float. This will store input and output and let's have a job handle to track when our parallel job has finished. Our parallel job is going to implement the iJob parallel 4 interface. This interface runs the execute method once per index which allows Unity to schedule chunks of iterations across multiple threads for parallel execution. Let's declare a read-only array of vector3 positions. The read-only attribute tells the job system that multiple threads can safely read this data concurrently because no writes will occur. Then we can also have a writable native array of type float called results. So each result in this array will store the computed distance for the corresponding position. We need to have an execute method and it's going to be called once per index value, potentially in parallel, depending on contention and worker availability. For each position p, we'll calculate its Euclidean distance from the origin, taking the square root of the sum of squared components. We'll then store that result in the matching index of the results array. Outside of this job struct, let's declare another native array to hold all the positions, and we'll pass this into the job each frame. So inside of our start method, we can allocate and initialize the data for our job, let's say 10,000 positions. We can allocate two persistent arrays, one to store the positions and another to store the computed distances. 
Then let's fill the position array with a simple pattern, 100 by 100 grid on the X and Y axis with a sinusoidal variation on Z. In update, we'll schedule our job so it can run while the rest of the frame continues. Let's create a new instance of distance job, assigning both the position array and the results array. Then we can call schedule with two parameters, the total number of elements and a batch size of 64. This tells Unity to divide the 10,000 iterations into groups of 64 and distributing those groups across available worker threads. 64 isn't a special number, it's just a balanced default that gives good scheduling efficiency for most mid-weight workloads. For lighter workloads, you might want to use a bigger number, but if each iteration is heavy with lots of math, you might want to use a smaller batch size, and it will give you a more even distribution, but of course this is something you'll be able to see in the profiler. Let's finish this up by calling complete in late update and also in on destroy. Let's release any of the persistent memory we allocated in start. Well, let's jump back to Unity and see what this looks like in the profiler. Let's go right into play mode and have a look. It's running on every frame, but let's just grab the first one. If I expand jobs on the left, we're going to start to see something very interesting, especially once I click on one of the worker jobs. So here you can see that one call from the main thread has begun to execute parallel jobs on all 22 workers that I have. You can still get information about any of them by selecting and some information will show up in the right panel. Additionally, in the bottom panel, you're going to be able to see all the same stats as before. But now, of course, the numbers like average time start to become a more useful metric. If we scroll up to the top, you know, notice something else interesting, and that is that the scheduler decided to execute one of these jobs on the main thread. You can see the purple arrow pointing to it there. This doesn't inherently block the frame unless it's waiting on dependencies or completion. It just means that the main thread is participating as a worker to keep all the cores utilized. On my system, I have 24 cores, which means 24 logical processors. Unity detects those 24 logical threads, reserves one for the main thread, and exposes 23 total job workers. So let's make it slightly more interesting by adding one more dependent job here. It's just going to implement iJob. It'll take in those results from the previous execution. In the execute method, let's just total them all up by iterating over all the results, summing them all together. Then we can page down to the update method. Let's store the first handle as handle A. Then we'll create a new version of our dependent job, passing in the results from the previous. And then we'll schedule it, passing in handle A as a dependency. Let's just grab any frame here. Something nice you can do is use the filter and just type in what you're looking for so that you don't have so much clutter. Now we can start to see our more complicated system visualized. So now here we can visualize how our dependent job ran on the main thread, but only after all of the parallel jobs were complete. Now, the dependent job might not always run on the main thread. It could run on one of the workers if the scheduler decides that's best. Notice what happens if I select that dependent job and come over to the right panel and start hovering over its dependencies. The view will change to show you exactly where that was. So if you're trying to debug why something has gone awry, you can easily follow through the flow of all the dependencies and see exactly what's going on. And as your systems start to get more and more complex, this is going to be extremely useful, especially if you're starting to get into the world of dots. Notice too in the bottom panel, because I filtered down by the word parallel or part of it, we can see the parallel class, mono behavior, and the names of the jobs inside of it that ran. Beside the filter, there's also some display settings and experimental settings you can play with. If you have any thoughts or feelings about this, head over to the Unity Discussions page. The devs are actively looking for input and suggestions. And with that, I've got to wrap it up. Don't forget to join us on Discord if you like. Of course, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can learn something new every Sunday. I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.